Hey, good evening, everybody. It's Steve with Real Progressives. And tonight we have a special guest. We tried to have Rohan on a few weeks back and for whatever reason, our technical problems with these live streams persisted. And so we were promised that we could reschedule. And sure enough, I've got the founder and president of the Modern Money Network, Rohan Gray, joining Real Progressives right now. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you tonight? Good. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Good deal, man. So are we. So I want you to tell us who you are and what the Modern Money Network is. Sure. Um, I'm uh, Australian. I'm from Sydney. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I was formerly a musician, a French horn and cello primarily, a classical musician and a music teacher. I did um, daycare, you know, early infant music as well as K-12 to classroom and instrumental and choir music. And uh, since uh, since law school, I've been running the Modern Money Network, which is a nonprofit that aims to educate the public about money and finance from a sort of interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary uh, perspective, looking at how those ideas and, uh, affect the way that we make public policy. And our organization is a network, so it's fi uh, primarily focused on finding people who are interested in these ideas and who want to uh, help bring them to the public and help them affect the way that we shape public policy and society. Uh, so we're primarily based in New York. Uh, most of us in the organization are uh, lawyers or are involved in economics and uh, sort of justice more generally. Um, we have people from a range of backgrounds, computer science, finance, um, as well as people who uh, just have an interest in this from their, you know, daily life or just as a, as a citizen um, or, an, or, or, you know, member of the community. Uh, and we primarily do educational programming. We do events at universities and other places that are, you know, broadcast and recorded um, that explore issues related to money and finance and law. Uh, and try to sort of push the envelope in different discussions and bring a sort of modern money informed perspective to the uh, to the topic that might not have otherwise you know uh, been considered relevant to that framework. Well, I, I got to tell you, going back a ways, I remember seeing the pictures back back when I first joined uh, the Modern Money Planning Committee. Um, I remember yeah. seeing pictures of you smiling at a table with all these grand economists that I worshipped. And there you are sitting there pretty with all of our heroes, man. I mean, and, and then little by little, I don't know if folks realize this, but this is one of the most important to you. It may not be, but to these guys, that article that you and Scott Fulweiler were quoted in when it came to the John Oliver story in Market Watch regarding Jill Stein's uh, student loan plan and so forth was masterful. You guys, you didn't beat her over the head. You kind of showed where she was wrong, and then you showed how what she said could be done. Can, can you talk a little bit about that whole process there for a minute? Yeah, sure. So it was a very interesting moment, and uh, you know, I would say it's not completely comparable, but it's close to the trillion-dollar coin moment that we had a few years back in terms of how a public policy issue um, that has rising public attention – and concern combined with um, a sort of interesting or quirky or unusual proposal for addressing that leads to a kind of level of public interest in the sort of esoteric details of policy that you wouldn't otherwise get. So this issue about student debt uh, is obviously an increasing one. Um, student loans and student loan-backed securities are one of the largest markets now that are growing and uh, with, with not necessarily, you know, uh, equivalent uh, repayment rates or possibilities of repayment. So there are issues there. Um, and they, you know, the students being a very large uh, political force that's getting increasing relevance today with the youth taking over the sort of Sanders wing of the Democratic Party and bringing a whole new energy um, to the political discourse. So their concerns are getting uh, highlighted in, in a way that they, you know, weren't necessarily in previous years. And when this idea of what do we do with the student debt comes up, one of the issues is that student debt is sort of uniquely non-dischargeable 
in bankruptcy in a way that other debt is. And this was the result of largely a propaganda campaign in the 70s by various crediting institutions and others involved in that sphere who portrayed students as sort of lazy and untrustworthy and said, if we give them these educations for free, they'll immediately default and run away and, you know, won't have any sense of obligation, even though there was no evidence at the time that, you know, default rates on student debt were particularly high relative to any other form of debt. So it was, it was really a propaganda campaign. But since then, there has been legal prohibitions against bankruptcy and student debt unless it was extremely, extremely uh, difficult for you to do so and you could prove that. So normally what happens is you just sort of carry this debt around like a ball and chain around your ankle to the point where even welfare benefits can be automatically garnished. So, you know, the robot is deducting from your welfare check before you even have a chance to protest or, or contest the issue. And um, the proposal was to use the central bank's balance sheet, that is to say the big, large infinity sign next to the amount of dollars that the United States government has, to take on to the public balance sheet student debt and then forgive that debt on behalf of the students. So... This is motivated by a number of justifications, one being that public education should be free, another being a lot of this debt was issued under false pretenses, that is to say universities promising certain increased out outcomes in terms of likelihood of employment or increased earning potential that didn't come true as a result of either those universities not being able to deliver or the market generally not being good for jobs that those particular employers would have little control over. So there was this idea that students were sort of not really entered into those debts in good with a good understanding and were kind of misled into what the benefits of doing so would be, particularly in a society that really reifies getting an education as a sort of social goal, not just even return on your investment, but just as something that civilised people do. So that was one part of it. Another part was the idea that a lot of these loans were already implicitly backed by the federal government. So they were student, they were issued either through the Department of Education or bought up by the Department of Education or backed by the Department of Education and sold to private holders. So the idea here also was that even if there should be some sort of, in inverted commas, reckoning with these student debtors so that they have to sort of feel the pain and not just get off, so to speak, scot-free without having to pay these debts, that that issue was best settled as a government issue and not as an issue of large debt markets potentially facing, you know, widespread default in the way that we saw with the mortgage crisis. So the idea was if this debt is supposed to be safe, let's just make it safe put the debt onto the government balance sheet and say this is a problem between the government and a set of its citizenry or its population um, to deal with what are the best public policy ways of going forward with this sort of relationship where on one hand students were provided with an education, at least on paper. Obviously, it depends whether you go to CUNY or the University of California or Harvard or whether you go to one of these private for-profit scam colleges. Um, but let's let's put that issue to the side and just deal with how this affects the financial markets. And the idea was that the central bank could do this um, without it being macroeconomically problematic. So a lot of people would think that if you monetize the debt, you're going to have widespread inflation because you're essentially printing money and injecting it into the economy. And one of the points we wanted to make was that that's not the case because this debt is already out there being held as an asset by the private sector. So there are institutions and investors that are holding these student loans and saying, this is worth something to me in the same way as a home loan is worth something in a mortgage backed security. So the, the idea of monetizing debt in this context has effects in terms of the quality of those debt instruments, but it doesn't necessarily have an effect on the overall quantity of those of instruments out there in circulation. So it's not some huge increase in sort of in inverted commas, the money supply. Um, 
And the other point about this was that in doing so, the interest rates that are being set on this debt could be determined as part of broader central bank monetary policy. So just because these loans were taken out at 5% doesn't mean that the students would be required to pay 5%. That could be something the central bank could choose to do, or it could choose to set a new rate and essentially allow students to refinance, say at zero with a deferred you know, repayment plan until they start earning above a certain amount of income, which would effectively turn that debt by the back door into a sort of income-based repayment plan, which is a quite commonly talked about higher education financing proposal that still allows for some sort of re-redistribution back from students in recognition of the fact that compared to the broader population, they have been given a public investment in their education that was worth a significant amount and therefore are more privileged than people might who didn't get that access might otherwise be in terms of their earning potential. Of course, when Jill Stein proposed this, she used language that was borrowed from a larger debate around monetary policy going back to 2008 and 2009 called quantitative easing. This term was a sort of dense, jargony sounding term that was designed to sort of obscure the fact that essentially what they were doing was monetizing debt in the exact way I was just describing, but rather than using uh, uh, student debt, they used treasury securities and uh, other assets eventually. So they would buy, for example, a million dollars of 30 year treasury bonds with a million dollars of reserves and, or a million and a few, you know, small change. And if you have a million dollars in bonds, now you have cash. Now, maybe that was more useful to you than having bonds, but it certainly wasn't the difference between having no money and suddenly having a million dollars. You had a million dollars in your assets. Your sort of, if you tallied up how much your family million dollars would have been on there alongside, you know, your house or your car or your whatever else you might have, the family jewels. So quantitative easing was something that central bankers did, and it got a lot of criticism because it bought primarily financial assets. So if you bought labor, and steel and children's paintings, that would have been fiscal policy, literally printing money and giving it to people to do things, including give you their time and energy. But to do it and buy pieces of paper, people thought was misguided and was, uh, you know, the wrong place to inject all of this new money. Now, I think there's a really good argument for more fiscal policy. I've been making that argument consistently for six years now. But the the idea that monetary policy and fiscal policy are the same is kind of missing the point because what you're really doing when you buy up a debt like that is changing the composition of assets in the private sector, not adding to them. So when Jill Stein said quantitative easing for the people, she was borrowing a term that Jeremy Corbyn had popularized in the UK. And the idea was, well, if we can print money and give it to the banks, why can't we print money and use it for fiscal policy? That point is 100% correct. So the, the fundamental insight that is being driven at here is not wrong. It is really correct and very important. But what they did in the language was trying, they were, in my opinion, it was sort of almost like being too clever by half because it was trying to use this language in a way that said, well, you know, if it goes to the rich, why can't it go to the poor? But what it really ended up doing was perpetuating a misunderstanding of the way the central bank works. And so when they said, hey, if you can do this, why can't you do that? Everybody who actually understood what central banking, how central banking works, laughed at them. The problem with that is they were trying to change public understanding on a very big issue, which is it's okay to print money and use it to buy things when you are in a depressed economy like we're in today. It's not going to be inflationary. So what they did in trying to tell people this really important truth that needs to be get out to get out there was attach it, you know, sort of like a cancer to this idea that QE is printing money which meant that once the so-called experts and insiders discredited the part that QE is printing money, 
the other part got discredited as well. Which is not the wrong... So they didn't make the wrong argument. They used the wrong language. You know, and I'm a lawyer and I think a lot about how to use the right language. And this was unfortunately a foreseeable mistake. And as a result, people like John Oliver were able to completely laugh at her with a grain of truth behind it. And this is the classic propaganda tool is you couch a very big lie around a grain of truth that the other side doesn't want to acknowledge. And because the other side doesn't want to acknowledge it, that truth grows and grows and fills the whole lie up. And so the truth that John Oliver was able to accuse Jill Stein of not wanting to acknowledge is that there really is a difference between, in inverted commas, printing money and buying other financial assets and printing money and buying real goods and services. In my opinion, that acknowledgement, one, sorry, one last thing, is, is, is it's not a concession we have to be afraid of making. They were afraid of making it because they couldn't back up technically what happens next. But we can. We understand the way the monetary system works. We can, we can make this argument and not make that mistake. See, that's beautiful. And see, folks, if, if you hear nothing else tonight, and we're going to say a lot more, but if you hear nothing else what you've just realized in one fell swoop is that modern monetary theory is the substance behind the bumper stickers. It's the substance behind all the grand plans. It's the substance behind every single thing Bernie Sanders put forward. It's the substance that put everything Jill Stein put forward. And they, unfortunately, many of them, they don't know how to make it happen. It takes modern monetary theory and understanding of the mechanics behind our federal financing system to be able to do this. That's why these talks are so important. That's why it's not just some academic exercise. This is why it's so important to be able to talk. You don't have to be a genius at this stuff, folks. You don't even have to be the world's best at describing this stuff, but you do need to know some basics, which leads me, Rohan, to my next question. We get three primary questions from the Dollarati, as I call them. The, 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 these people come in there. Well, the federal bank, the central bank, is a Rothschilds. It's a it's a private thing, man. We we're in debt. We're owned by the Rothschilds. Rothschilds own America, and and so all of a sudden we lose any potential of talking about policy space. We immediately lose any potential of talking about the realities of federal financing. Uh, we lose all the space because they're busy chasing after some phantom. Talk to us a little bit about the history of the Federal Reserve and what its function is as opposed to 1913, what it is today. You know, what, what do we have here? Talk, talk to our, our followers here about what the Federal Reserve is and is not. Sure. And um, I, I just like to sort of reemphasize, I completely agree with what you're saying about learning a bit of the technicals and this being the sort of substantive meat. Now, I, I, I think the heart is still where, where politics is always where, with people and actual suffering, but I think it's very important to deal with the world and the way that it works. And that includes understanding institutions, social institutions and legal institutions and how they structure society. People say the wheels of justice turn slowly but exceedingly fine institutional dynamics may work subtly but they work exceedingly fine over history and it's important to understand how they affect politics because otherwise it's like bending it's like bending a young willow you can do it in the short run but over time it bends itself back or the water that over time erodes stone so it's very important to understand those dynamics as well um, now, when it comes to this issue about the Rothschilds, the first thing I want to say is it's worth separating out political power and institutional formal structure. So you can have, you know, to use that Disney Aladdin movie, you can have the Sultan sitting on the throne and you can have Jafar standing next to him. And you can have two people standing in front of them arguing for an hour about whether the Sultan is in charge or Jafar is in charge. But what it turns out is you're really asking different questions. One is, 
who is the person whose signature goes on the decisions that get made? And the other person is saying, who has the power to influence the content of those decisions? So those are two di very different and related, obviously, questions. But w it's important to know which question is being asked so that people don't argue over those answers. Now, when it comes to the Federal Reserve, I think 50 or 60 percent of the disagreement ends up often being about the fact that one person is trying to have a conversation about one of those questions and the other person wants to give the answer to the other question because they think that's the more important thing to be talking about. So to the question of whether there are things like private power, I think you could that is absolutely the case there are private power. I obviously don't think it's the Rothschild sitting in some high tower in Transylvania or something, but <laughs> I think it's important to talk about how even when there are public institutions, those institutions can be subject to the influence of private power. And I don't think you need to go further than debates over, for example, campaign finance to see how you can do that perfectly well. These are public elections, but they are being run by private entities. When it comes to the Fed, however, the argument often seeps over into the idea that there are structural owner, ownership claims. So it's not just that the Fed is a captured institution by private interests in the way that I might say the FCC is captured by the telecom industries or the FDA is captured by the pharmaceutical industries. That's not the claim that often gets made. The claim is stronger than that, which is that the Fed is actually legally owned by private entities. And that is, I think, silly. And I think that's your point as well. And I'm happy to explain why. Yeah, so please. First, <laughs> so first of all, as a lawyer, you there are multiple layers of law. In the same way as the MMT is talk about the hierarchy, your personal IOU is money, and on the other hand, a bank IOU is money, and on the other hand, a government IOU is money, but they are different kinds of money, and they have different sort of spheres of circulation and uses and things there are different levels of law. You can say something is illegal because of a regulation. You can say something is illegal because of a statute. And you can say something is illegal because it is unconstitutional. Those are different claims at different levels of the system, right? So when you're talking about the Fed, one thing that you could say is that when it comes to ownership, all property rights have to be sanctioned by the state. So there is always ultimately state sanction on any private activity that is considered legal because by definition, if it wasn't sanctioned, it wouldn't be legal. So it's to say, for example, private entities own all of the wealth is to say that we have given private entities property rights that we recognize over that wealth. When it comes to the Federal Reserve, the first thing to note is that legally speaking, it is created by an act of Congress. There is a thing called the Federal Reserve Act. Now, the Federal Reserve Act is not just is not the only institution that establishes the legal basis for the Federal Reserve. There is also the very basis of corporate law, which was a government legal institution originally founded basically like private public partnerships. They were royal grants of a charter to entities to do things on behalf of the government. So you wanted to have ships get spices from India, you create a corporation. The, the king signs a, a royal charter and a corporation gets formed and goes and does it. Over time, that corporation starts to declare its independence, says I should have some rights to do things separate to the interest of the, the crown, blah, blah, blah. Over time, they widen the sphere of things that can be corporations. And then eventually you have this idea that there is private interest alongside public interest in the corporate form. So the entities that we would call banks are chartered corporations with special banking privileges. They still today, and Robert Hockett and Sal Leon Marover at Cornell Law School wrote a great piece called The Finance Franchise and another great piece called Special vestigial or visionary, what the cor what the banking charter can tell us about the corporate form and vice versa, or maybe it's vice versa. But both of those pieces look at the origins of private banking corporations in public grants of legal discretion. That is to say, banks emerged from the state, legally speaking. 
just like private corporations did. More generally, banks are a special subset of corporations. One of the points that Hockett and Omarova make is the very nature of banks as a industry means that today their public-private partnership nature is much more visible than most other corporations. So the very fact that banks still have a special banking license and are subject to regulatory oversight and get access to the central bank for their discount window, all of those things are recognising that banks are not just private actors like you and me. They are explicitly publicly public-private partnerships or, or syntheses, what, what Hockett and Omarova would call a franchisee of government authority. So before you even get to the Fed and its relationship to banks, it's important to note that both banks and the Fed, the structure of those institutions are creatures of the state. Then the question is who owns what? Who directs what? And the common refrain is, well, the Federal Reserve is comprised of a series of regional banks. Those federal regional banks have member banks, like your local bowling club has local members, right? And those member banks own the regional bank so that the whole network is made up of a series of regional banks that are owned by member private banks. Because those banks are private, they say the Fed itself must be private. Then, of course, there is the fact that the most important entity in the Federal Reserve System today is not any of those regional banks, but the Federal Open Market Committee, which is based in Washington, D.C., and has got membership from presidents of those banks, but is a separate institution, just like you may have a national sorority or fraternity society that's made up of local chapter presidents, but that doesn't mean that the national level is simply being directed by the member, by each local membership uh, organization. Now, the reason that the, they this argument hasn't been able to be killed definitively is because the law is, and law sometimes does this, misleading. The law was created in a way that gives the impression of private ownership at a very formalistic level even as discretionary control is not exercised at that level. And I'm, of course, talking here about the stock ownership of the bank, of the, of the regional banks. So if you look in the Federal Reserve Act, one thing you can see is that private regional banks, when they become members of their regional Fed, pay in, so to speak, and they get shares in that bank. So the logic people think is, well... If I buy shares in a company, I own that company. Therefore, if there's banks buying shares in a regional Fed, the bank must own the Fed. The reason that's not true is because those shares don't operate like regular shares. And even if they did, the banks don't operate like regular banks. So those shares, what they really are, functionally speaking, is they're a way for banks to get return on dividends and to pay for the cost of operating the Fed. Now, those two amounts, whether they get more in or less in, those could be varied. What the Federal Reserve Regional Banks wanted was to have both of those powers, the power to demand money from them and the power to suck money back out. Now, if you think about it logically, of course it's better to have both powers because you can always just not use one. Whereas if you just had the power to suck out money or if you just had the power to give them, you could still vary them like a temperature knob, but you wouldn't be able to have as much variation in both directions. So by saying, look, you have to pay in almost like a tax on banks. And then on the other hand, you get dividends out, you know, stop complaining as long as we make sure the dividends are pretty good for you. So in the statute, it says, average dividends are going to be something like 6% and they get this like clockwork on that stock. So it's, it's sort of like putting your hat in the ring and keeping it there so that you've got some skin in the game. The other part is that the history of the Federal Reserve goes back before 1913 when the Federal Reserve Act was founded and it had its origins in a network of private banks. So one can trace a story of the development of the Federal Reserve as one of increasing public ownership over the private banking network. So you can imagine the federal, the, the government 
allowing private banks to emerge, both at the federal and the state level, and then those banks developing sort of effectively network effects, and then the federal government taking over those network effects with the 1860 Federal Banking Act and keeping them. What happened in the late 20th century was there was a, and the banks started not trusting each other, and there was a sort of systemic breakdown like we saw in 08, and the banks stepped in and created their own mini central bank and said, look, we'll provide our own liquidity and we'll let each other settle all of our debts off against each other. And in doing so, we'll avert this calamity and we'll stay in control. And Chase at one point in the early 20th century was even the treasury secretary. So there was this sort of revolving door between the people at the top of the banking system and running the government. So there was definitely cronyism. There was definitely private interest involved. There was definitely corruption. This is those claims about the sort of influence are not false. But technically speaking, the 1913 Federal Reserve Act was a creature of Congress and it established a set of public institutions that although they had on paper shareholder banks were ultimately subject to government control. That said, that creation was a political compromise with financial interests at the time. So it was explicitly designed and Peter Conti Brown, the legal professor, is a very good historian on this. He just wrote a whole book on it, I highly recommend, uh, called The Power and Independence of the Federal Reserve. When it was created, it was explicitly a sort of compromise with private banking interests. So in the same way as you can look at the Obamacare Act, the Affordable Care Act, and see it as a sort of compromise with private medical interests, the Federal Reserve Act was a compromise in the way of saying you get to sort of have some power that we're not going to take over. What became clear over time was that the most important power was the power over interest rates, and that increasingly got centralized. So at the beginning, those regional banks were public institutions, but they were mostly staffed by private banking interests. And then those private banking interests had an alternative power base against which they fought in Washington, D.C. with the Federal Open Market Committee. And that Federal Open Market Committee ended up winning that fight in 1935, which at that point, the decisions to set interest rates were made exclusively effectively in DC. Now that fight was fought mostly between the New York Fed and the DC Fed, because the New York Fed was the one responsible for doing most trades involving treasury debt. So they were the ones, like we were talking about QE earlier, they were the ones that were monitoring and controlling the membrane between treasury debt and cash and how much gets to slip through one way and how much gets to slip through the other way. They retained control in DC, even as they might've had banking interests, you know, play in their policy decisions. And the big fight then came, funnily enough, between the DC board and the treasury. So as I was saying, if you can imagine this sort of history of an increasing of taking of private banking power and moving it closer to the public institutions, the creation of the Fed was a step forward in that trajectory. And then the creation of the Federal Open Market Committee on top of the regional banks was a step forward in that process. And then the fight between the Federal Open Market Committee and the Treasury Department was a step forward in that. It was bringing this power closer and closer to, you know, the President and the Treasury Secretary. And what happened was the Treasury Secretary said it's war. And because it's war, we want to make sure we're not paying too much interest on the national debt because paying interest on that debt is effectively giving fiscal subsidies to owners of that debt. They're just getting interest for holding out, you know, for lending us cash and getting a cash-like instrument in return. So keep the interest rates pegged at 2.25% at the very long end and keep it pegged at something like three-eighths of a percent at the very short rate. So what this did was make very clear that those interest rates were a policy decision of the federal open market committee. If they said, we want long rates to be 2% and we want short rates to be three-eighths, They had the tools, they had the power with their buying and selling because of that infinity sign to back that up 
and the markets didn't fight them. The market said, look, we know you can back it up. We're not going to go fight. You know, it's like a computer game where there's an evil character that's invincible because he's important to the storyline. You don't keep trying to attack him. You just move on. They didn't keep trying to fight the Fed. When the Fed said the interest rate is 2%, it stayed there. Of course, the bankers hated this for two reasons. One, 2% is not that much interest. And two, it makes it very clear that the private bond market is not financing the government. Because what you're effectively doing is the central bank says we're going to ensure that the interest rate is 2% because we're going to buy any single treasury bond you don't want at 2%. And so it became very clear that the private bond market was just a pass through between the treasury and the Fed. And it made the bond market sort of mystical power to put their thumb up or down on the economy based on how much they liked the policy of the government in power, the sort of referendum on the government by the market, it rendered that myth a complete farce. It just it pulled back the curtain. And so what happened was there was a very bitter fight between the Truman administration of after the war. The Fed said, okay, the war's over. Let us take control of the reins again. And Truman said, nah, we actually like this because this is cheaper for us. We can get more schools and bridges and, yes, unfortunately, bombs and, and planes, fighter planes. Just every time we had to spend a dollar on public services, now we're paying five cents of interest. This is a way better deal for us. Let's keep it this way. Thank you very much. And the Fed said, oh, well, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. We have to have it. Uh, we have to have the market determined because, you know, the market needs to be able to exercise some discipline on, on the, the government and show whether it has confidence in the government spending. And so what happened was this was a really big fight. It wasn't a fight between private banks and the government. It was a fight between bureaucrats in the Federal Reserve who were loyal to banking interests and bureaucrats in the treasury who were loyal to the kind of populist administration of Truman at the time. So it was an intra-public sector fight. Of course, there were different interests being represented, but it wasn't the Rothschilds sitting, you know, in their Donald Trump tower down at Wall Street. It was the Federal Reserve Bank at Wall Street having a fight. And it was, it was like a movie plot, says Aaron in the comments. It was like a movie plot because this fight played out on the front page of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. The Treasury Secretary and the Chairman of the Fed were actively fighting each other. And the Fed was saying, you've put us in a straitjacket because our mandate is for price stability. But you are forcing us to keep these interest rates low, which is causing inflation. So you've tied our hands behind our back, can't do our jobs. That was the party line in the Fed. And what the Truman administration said was, BS. We call BS on that. If you wanted to curb inflation, you could curb inflation by making credit harder to issue, so to speak, financial repression or credit rationing or qualitative credit controls. So in the same way there was quantitative easing, you could have qualitative tightening. And the idea here was a bank making a $500 million loan to a casino in Nevada is not just taking $500 million of someone's savings and spending it. It's not just sort of taking money from someone's pocket that's sitting idle and spending it. It is actively creating new purchasing power. It is actively creating new credit that functions like money bank deposits. And so what the Truman administration knew, they were sort of sniffing a rat here, and the Fed didn't want to acknowledge is that when it comes to inflation, it's just as inflationary to allow a casino to get a $500 million loan as it is to allow $500 million to be spent on childcare or on bombs even. Obviously, when I say it's just as inflationary, I'm not saying that any $500 million is going to have an equal effect no matter how you spend it. It obviously matters how you spend it. But the point is there were real resources being used in the, in the fine, you know, when you make it, give someone a bank loan that contribute to full resource usage in the same way as real resources get used when the federal government spends. So Truman's point was, 
if we have to start cutting somewhere, if we're at sort of full employment and we're at an inflationary economy, we're sort of overheated, as you're telling me, Mr. Federal Reserve, or Mrs. Federal Reserve now, if that's what the problem is, then let's start dampening by first turning to private credit rather than cutting public spending. So the idea here is, you know, the sort of joke that the, the joke about Catholics that nobody nobody weeps for an unfertilized sperm. The yeah. idea here is nobody nobody weeps for a loan that never gets made. Right? Nobody weeps for to when when there were only eight new casinos built, not nine, nobody knows what the, the the nobody knows what that potential would be. And the idea is that private loans don't have a right to exist any more than public education has a right to exist. You know, prima facie, we think it has a right because we've agreed on it. But nobody sat down as a public, as a political community, and said, "Do we want more?" casinos than we want public spending people know that if there's inflation we have to cut spending and truman's point was let's start with private bank lending and the federal reserve obviously hated this they didn't want to talk about it they didn't want to countenance this and by the way this whole conversation if you want to learn more about this there is an, a great article on the richmond fed's new website called uh, the treasury fed accord a new nor- narrative account by Hetzel and Leach. Um, and this, it goes into detail about this from, from accounts of people who were there. This fight going on, and it went to the front cover of the New York Times, and eventually Truman lost, in part because he was dealing with other issues at the time, notably the Korean War, and he, lo- he didn't have enough political capital to keep fighting on every front. So before we even get to why he lost this issue, if he hadn't been dealing with other issues, it's possible he could have won this issue and we would have a very different Federal Reserve System than we had today. But he lost this issue, and the reason he lost this issue was because one of the people involved in the Treasury's team, a man named William McChesney Martin, basically double-crossed him. So they were saying, how are we going to fight the Fed? You know, How are we going to keep this fight up? And McChesney Martin, uh, sorry, the Treasury Secretary, a guy named Snyder, at the time, who was very loyal to Truman, was willing to go head to head with the Fed. He said, you know, stuff you. I'm just going to say no. And the Fed started making announcements behind the Treasury's back. So the Treasury said, we're not going to announce an increase. And the Fed said, oh, yes, there's an increase coming. And there was this sort of misdirection, like we're sort of seeing in the Trump administration now with different agencies fighting and things. And so what happened was the the Treasury Secretary... um, said, I can't work with the chairman of the Fed. Now, the Fed chairman is put in for eight years or seven years and can't be removed except for cause. So the president can't just fire the Fed chairman. But, and this is the magic of good legal thinking, if the Treasury secretary says, I can't work with the Fed chairman, the Fed chairman has to resign. This is one of these sort of gentlemen's arrangements when it comes to how bureaucracies work. Because technically the Fed chairman is under the Treasury Secretary. So if the Treasury Secretary says, I can't work with my underling, the underling is supposed to resign in the same way as bureaucrats resign when a new president comes in and gives the president a choice of hiring them back. So the the Federal Reserve was losing at this point in the battle. And the Federal Reserve was about to lose its chairman and they were going to point one of their own guys and say, fine, we'll just, you know, fight another day. And William McChesney Martin on the Treasury side, and edge of this almost kind of serendipitous moment in history where the Treasury Secretary had to go in a hospital for an operation. So he was MIA for a couple of days. And McChesney Martin basically called the Fed and said, I'm going to broker a deal. I'm going to make peace. I'm going to do my Middle East peace talks and become the hero of this story by, by sort of putting <laughs> mum and dad, you know, back together again. And so, you know, God knows what he said on those phone calls, but he eventually came to Dan Snyder and said, look, here's the idea, here's the plan. We'll let them get control back over long-term rates. So we'll agree that the decision of what long-term rates are going to be is up to the Fed. In exchange, we'll put one of our guys in power. So, yes, we'll hand over the power back from the Treasury to the Fed, 
but in exchange, we'll, we'll, it'll be our guys at the Fed. So who cares? They said, okay, well, I guess that's going to be the same thing. You know, the only thing better than defeating the enemy is putting a puppet as its leader. Sure. And who did they pick? Well, the mastermind of the plan himself, William McChesney Martin. It's like Dick Cheney <laughs> doing a, a VP search and deciding that actually he was the best guy for the job. <laughs> so William McChesney Martin was appointed as the first as the first Fed after this accord. And what did he do immediately after? He announced his full and firm support for raising interest rates in order to combat inflation, which was the goal of the Fed. That is to say, he immediately touted the banker party line. And there's a line in that article, which I'm glad you linked to everybody from the Richmond Fed by Hetzel and Leach at the very end, that notes after this all happened and the dust settled with Truman and, and uh, Korea and everything, William McChesney Martin was walking down the street in D.C., and Truman was walking down the street and Truman saw McChesney Martin, called him a traitor and walked to the other side of the road and kept walking. So when you ask me this question about is the Fed owned by private interests, on one hand, yeah, there's private interests, banker interests, you know, look at Wall Street running the, the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party. So, yeah, private banker interests are abound. But when you ask me, is the Fed a private institution? I say, of course not. The Federal Reserve Act established it. The banks that are members in inverted commas are also publicly chartered institutions. And the people who run the Fed are bureaucrats who have independence from the Treasury, but are still public bureaucrats and are still obligated to do things according to the Act and almost were just purely part of the Treasury under the President but for a intra-governmental bureaucracy fight over who has discretion over their own mandate. I hope that answers your question. Uh, <laughs> dude, no. You know what? I'm just realizing that, you know, you're just not that knowledgeable about this stuff. You know, you just out. <laughs> I can't even deal with a straight face. Dude, you were, you were the sharpest tool in the drawer, man. I, I'm telling you, I just sat here and I just – I went from being host – to just the guy that was looking for his popcorn. This was fantastic so far. So, oh, all right, so I, I've got to ask you the next question, right? So, you know, there's a lot of really, really good work out there that talks about inflation. Um, and there's a lot of really good works done by Bill Mitchell, um, good works by Randy Ray, good works by Stephanie and, and all the gang. Can you just, alleviate the people so when they forward this around as ammo in their you know tool pouch can you allay the fears of of you know what constitutes inflation what constitutes the the bad inflation the inflation we've got to worry about you know everybody jumps from what are you going to just print money and have hyperinflation and, you know yeah. we're a republic and blah blah in all the nonsense and and it really yeah. is the central issue you got the people running around the Fed, the Fed, but then you got the other hyperinflation. So can you talk to us sure. about that? Thanks, bud. Sure. So the, the first thing is to talk about what inflation is. And like I was saying before, some people talk past each other. There's a school of thought that are, definitionally defines inflation as any increase in the money supply. These are awesome. Now, what the money supply is becomes a contested thing in and of itself. But once you define inflation as any increase in the money supply, then you can point to, for example, prices being stable. And their response is, well, that's still inflation because if you didn't inject more money, prices would have fallen. So they define it in this way that it's not just increases in prices, it's, it's just mechanical as a matter of quantity. Now, when you're talking with people like that, there's no use arguing whether something is or isn't inflationary because you're arguing about different definitions of the same term. The more important question then is, who cares if it's inflationary under your definition? If prices remain stable and don't increase, if you want to call that inflation, fine. I call that benign inflation under your definition. And then the more important question becomes, why do you think it's important to allow deflation to happen in those situations? So you flip the script with those people. That's a very small subsect, of the, the Austrians who define it definitionally like that. The, the, most people define it as a, 
continuous increase in the price level. That is to say something was $5 one day, it's $6 the next day, it's $7 the next day, it's $8 the next day. Hyperinflation is defined as a continuous increase in the rate of increase of inflation. So this is sort of like the difference between speed and acceleration. Inflation could just be 1% a year every year. Hyperinflation would be 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, up to infinity, right? Exponential. So there is a difference there because one of those two is presumably stable, 1% a year. You might not like it, but it's only going to be 1% a year. It's going to be 1% a year a million years from now. It's not going to require this. It's not going to require the same type of response as something that is exponential, because exponential things, by definition, don't just keep growing. You know, the shape of that growth changes the nature of the thing. So when you have hyperinflation, you fundamentally have to make sure it doesn't happen. Otherwise, the currency system will break down. When you have sustained inflation, it might be uncomfortable, like walking around in pants that are too tight, but they're not shrinking to the point where you're going to lose circulation and die. So... The first point is what causes hyperinflation? And I'll get into what causes inflation in a minute. But the, f the fundamental point about hyperinflation is, historically speaking, when you have a sovereign currency, that is to say, a currency that is not backed by gold or a basket of goods, doesn't have a fixed exchange rate, and doesn't promise anything other than that that currency can be used in payment of taxes and fees and fines, Historically speaking, there hasn't been a democracy that has experienced a hyperinflation under those conditions. And it's important that it's a democracy, and I'll get back to that in a second. But hyperinflations are primarily associated with breakdowns in political and economic systems. They are not simply a matter of bad economic policy in terms of overspending. To say that would be like saying dying by alcohol consumption or drinking arsenic is the same as drinking too much water. You can, you could, you have to drink so much water to die. It would, you, you wouldn't get it in your mouth. You know, you, you would have to drink liters and liters and liters. Whereas when you're drinking arsenic or something, it's the quality of what you're drinking that kills you. So having inflation might be bad. Having 5% inflation a year might be bad in the same way as drinking too much water can make you feel ill, but it's not going to kill you in the way that drinking a glass of arsenic will. It's not going to kill you in the same way as doing the things that lead to hyperinflation will kill you. Now, going back to what inflation is, because it's an increase in the price level, the obvious question is what prices are we talking about? So the first point to note here is that in the same way as accounting rules are not just a matter of God, law, and natural intuition, they are constructed out of a series of decisions and value judgments by accountants and lawyers. In the same way as accounting is like that, definitions of inflation are politically constructed. Now, you have people on the right in zero hedge and in shadow stats and stuff who say, you know, the inflation rate's actually three times as high as we think it is. I don't necessarily agree with them. I think there are a, lot, a lot of them are cranks. But their point, their underlying point, which is that how we measure inflation can be gained just like we can gerrymander districts, is a valid point. We can gerrymander inflation just by choosing what we measure as inflation. We can gerrymander it to be make it seem like inflation is too high. We can make it to seem like inflation is too low, or we can just make it to seem like a particular number is relevant when it may not be at all. So when we talk about inflation, we're often talking about CPI, um, consumer price index. They take out things like food. Um, you know, Other sorts of commodities aren't necessarily in there, um, oil. So there is already important prices that are not being considered in the headline number of inflation. Um, and so the best way I think about inflation is I sort of close my eyes and imagine a hundred different people, whether it's people giving massages or people running local corner stores or people at the top of General Electric or whoever, making decisions about prices that go on a menu 
and I imagine the conversation they have right before they decide on a number to change. Now, maybe that conversation looks at recent sales. It looks at recent costs. Maybe it looks at their profit margins. Maybe it looks at a range of different things. But there's a bunch of people in a room making that decision and a price gets changed. It's not, it's not some mechanistic computer thing where you press up on one thing and then something else goes down. It's real people making real decisions that then get implemented. What that leads to the obvious conclusion is that there obviously isn't one reason why those things get changed. Because think about it. The, the, the masseuse that changes the cost of their massage from 60 to $70, the local shopkeep that changes the price of chewing gum and general electric that changes the price of um, your, you know, your, your fridge. And then Facebook that changes the price that they charge advertisers are going to be based on a whole range of different factors and considerations. So, and, and, and at different rates, they're not going to all wake up and read the, you know, the federal reserve's recent minutes and see that the federal reserve has increased the, you know, the rate of money by 2% and they go, Oh, well, 2% better raise all of our prices by 2%. That's not what they do. So there are a whole range of things that go into how prices are set including the market power of the participants in the market, both the producers and the buyers, the, the extent to which there are intermediaries, the extent to which there are supply chains, the extent to which there are political factors. You know, when OPEC decides to launch a strike against the West by unilaterally raising oil prices, that has a massive effect on a whole range of prices that involve oil. It has absolutely nothing to do with the, the, the money supply. It has absolutely everything to do with markets and power and institutional uh, dynamics and international flows based on legal arrangements. Can, can I get you to pause your vibe there for just a second? So the sure. inevitable thing that comes with what you just said is the banana dollar. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, the petrodollar. Can you just yeah. debunk the idea that we are somehow or another pegged to the petrodollar, that our currency – I mean – if we had sure. a banana trade, we would be on the banana dollar. Can, can you talk through that real quick before you go? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, if if the oxygen in the atmosphere gets soured, we're all dead and money's going to be worth nothing. So I guess we're on an oxygen standard on some level, right? <laughs> the point is that oil is a valuable commodity for a whole range of industries. And if the price goes up, that can affect how those industries function. That can absolutely have an effect on prices. That does not mean that the only thing backing the value of money is oil, and it does not mean that changes in the price of oil necessarily affect the changes in overall prices in a mechanistic way. So one way to deal with, for example, the petrodollar argument is to say, well, let's just reduce our dependency on oil. Now, obviously, that process is not going to just be a binary. We're not going to wake up one day and be dependent on oil and then wake up the next day and be independent, there's going to be a process of reducing dependence. And as we reduce our dependence, the ability of changes in the price of oil to affect the broader industry and the market is going to be less. So the influence of oil prices on prices more broadly is going to be reduced. So the important question is not, are we on a petrodollar standard or not? It's how much influence does changes in oil prices have on other prices, right? So... Yes, there can be times when changes in the price of oil can have changes in the price of a lot of other things. I would say that was for 1970. Oh, no, no, no. Don't freeze on me. <laughs> Did I freeze on you? Yeah, now you're back. Okay, good. Whew. I was so, worried it would lose you, man. You're rocking it. It was particularly true in the 70s when we were experiencing stagflation and when OPEC did its big move. But the classic problem of withdrawing something you've been giving people, withdrawing a carrot, is that if you do it enough, they start getting either used to having less carrots or they find carrots elsewhere and you become less relevant. So OPEC said, we're going to jack up the price of oil and really exercise our market power here. And it had a big effect in the short run. But at the same time as it was happening people realized we better never let them have this power over us again. And so what you saw at the late 70s, and partially this was already happening, was the deregulation of the natural gas industry. And the deregulation of the natural gas industry 
combined with OPEC sort of faltering and failing in its belligerence, sort of broke that blockade. And over time, you haven't seen any major producers or sellers of oil be able to mess with the price of oil in a way that has such aggressive effects on prices more generally. Okay. So l- let me ask you one final question because we're over now. I don't want to be re- uh, you know, disrespectful of your time here, Rohan. No, I'm happy First, to keep talking. I'm sorry I went for you know for such a long time. Uh, so dude, I, I, there's been very few times where I haven't wanted to jump in and have a like, but this is one of those times where you went places that I just don't typically go. And I just sat back and I was like, man, let him roll, let him go. <laughs> Um, so what I want to talk about, and, and this was the primary thing that I want to talk about tonight, but my God, I'm so glad I didn't shortchange myself here. You know, for, for the people out there that are, you know, watching and stuff, can you kind of talk about the different battlefields that we have to work in to make modern monetary theory? First of all, I will take a moment and say this. Modern monetary theory is not something to be implemented. It's not some philosophy. Modern monetary policy is currency analysis. It describes what is. And what we do with that can be Republican, as we've seen with the Reagan administration, you know, creating the the Cold War and and using it for military purposes. But it could also be used for the 99% and other ones. And that's political choices. MMT, though, is apolitical. It doesn't have a political bend to it. It's simply a scientific, it's currency analysis. It's literally looking at what happens and telling you and describing to you what it does. So when, when I hear people say, well, when are we going to go ahead and implement MMT? Or when are we going to go ahead and adopt MMT? I think what people are really saying is when are we going to actually leverage MM, leverage our currency system as it stands today, our federal financing system as it stands today, and actually serve the people? I think that's what I'm hearing them say. Um, can you talk to us about how to um, how those battles are occurring both in the streets, amongst the policy people, and up in the ivory towers? Sure. And yeah, I mean, I, I totally hear what you're saying, and. Uh, as, as Bill Mitchell would say, once you understand the implications of how our system works, it sort of leads to certain conclusions unless you're a sort of sociopath. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the, this, the theory is, is normative in that sense, you know, as much as, as Steve Colbert would say, reality has a well-known progressive bias. So, and, and, and with regards to your point that it can be read agnostically depending on your politics, I completely agree. And we used to joke, some of my friends and I, about the idea of there being Darth Vader Marxists, people who sort of read Marx and totally bought the idea of class struggle but came down on the other side. So they, they read all of the Marxian analysis. They, get, they say, great, good, this is how we have to fight against those people. So you could read Marx from both sides. You side with the, 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 the ruling class. And in the same way as once you understand, as MMT says, that unemployment is something created by the currency system and by the state as it imposes that currency system on people, then the question is, do does the state then have an obligation to give people a way to work so that they do not remain involuntarily unemployed? And if the answer, you think the answer is yes, you know, then you're sort of with most MMTers. If you think the answer is no, then you're still understanding and accepting the MMT analysis. But like the Darth Vader Marxist, you're coming to the conclusion that it's better to keep people in pain and suffering for whatever set of reasons you think is valuable. And that can then be rightly denounced. Um, It's ironic that we use that term Darth Vader Marxist at this time in history, given that Steve Bannon likes to identify as Darth Vader and has openly described himself as a Leninist. So I guess we have a real life Darth Vader Marxist (laughs) in the White House right now. Um, But um, to go to your point, yes, there are multiple vectors of fighting here. And the first thing I would say is that I firmly believe in grassroots mass democracy as the source of political power for progressive change. And I I strongly believe that leadership and that Uh, power comes from the bottom up when it is welded best and that when it comes to issues we're fighting today there are things like climate change there are 
international poverty and development issues. There are real resource usage issues. There is human trafficking and child slavery, and these are real issues. What I see with MMT is it's dealing with the issue that prevents us from dealing with those issues properly. So it's the meta issue. It's the speck of dust or, or splinter in our eye and that it is not so much the most important thing that we want to be teaching our children as much as it's the thing that hopefully we don't have to teach our children because it's not standing in the way of addressing real problems in the future. So I, you know, like sort of the, the utopians used to dream of a world where money doesn't exist, I like to dream of a world where debates over money don't exist because then we can have debates about what's important. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. Now, when it comes to street level movements, there is the street level movement to get people to understand MMT, which is hugely important. That's one thing. On the other hand, there are street level movements for just justice in general. People like Black Lives Matter or Occupy Wall Street or the Fight for 15 or global climate justice movements or Greenpeace or whoever you want to identify. And then the question is, are they using the insights that MMT provides to push the best argument for progressive change they can? So there are two different angles there, even at the street level. There's the MMT street fight, and there's bringing MMT to the street fight. And I see them as different but related. I see things like what you're doing is incredibly valuable for building that street level activism because it's bringing lo average people into the conversation and showing them how this conversation can be had at that level without you needing to have access to the, the, the temple or PhD or anything. And I don't mean that to belittle the intelligence of anyone that's involved at this level. All I mean by that is that this, these ideas are ideas that should be being discussed at the beer hall, over coffee, on the streets, at the dog walking parks. And what you're doing is the right way to do that. And the historical analogy here is, I believe, the populist moment at the end of the 19th century with William Jennings Bryan when he stood up and said, you will not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. At that time in history, monetary debates were front and center in public discourse. These were things that people talked about around the beer hall, H-A-L-L -L for the commenter who's wondering. These were things that people talked about all day. They were front and center issues in the same way as things like Snowden and surveillance are issues today because money was acknowledged to be an important social technology. We do have some debates today, for example, Bitcoin. The average person has probably heard of Bitcoin even if they don't understand how it works properly because most of the public conversation around it is misleading and wrong. Another one which I believe became popular in part because of it was technological was the conversation about the trillion dollar platinum coin. It wasn't just that a trillion dollars is crazy sounding because we propose trillion dollar public spending programs all the time and people just yawn. It was the fact that this was a coin that had a trillion dollars. If people closed their eyes and imagined a coin or if there was a picture of a coin, it's bizarre to them to see a trillion dollars on that. So what we were showing them in that debate was a new form of monetary technology and that pushed a, a new conversation. So what was happening in the populist moment was that this was being discussed on the streets because money was explicitly understood to be in a state of technology to a fiat system and earlier 20 30 years earlier there had been the national banking act that had finally dealt with the huge hodgepodge of private banks that had been around at the state and federal level that were doing all kinds of crazy things including fraud and the national banking act brought them all together under a new system that was the sort of early precursor to the federal reserve and the network of private banks I was talking about earlier. So when you had this flux, and just to give you a bit of history, I know this, but through a lot of the 19th century, the average shopkeep or business owner used to keep books of all of the different kinds of bank currency and how much they were worth relative to each other. It was sort of like friends and you had a credit score book and every month it would get updated so that you knew how much their IOUs had to be discounted by. Well, the Bank of North Dakota is very trustworthy, but everybody knows the Bank of Mississippi, you know, wouldn't trust them. And these books would be layers and layers of grids showing the price changes in these banknotes. An average bank 
average businessman had to know, know these price changes like you follow the stock market today because if they didn't know, they might end up accepting a piece of paper in payment for something that wasn't worth the number that was printed on it. So money wasn't even standardized back then at the federal level. Each piece of paper was issued by a different issuer and had a different level of creditworthiness. And so people had to be far more knowledgeable about the state of money. So we've almost the victims of our own complacency in that sense. Now, when it comes to the activism today, one area is focusing around technology that we could do. Um, another area is going to social movements and pointing out that it is misunderstandings about current financing that are holding them back in their arguments. And the obvious one is, so you say, I want to give more money for starving children. And people say, where do you get the money to pay for it? That's the first hurdle. And, the, and that phrase is a loaded question, sort of like the classic, when did you stop beating your wife? You can't answer that question well. The minute you even countenance answering that question, you've already lost. So when you say, how are you going to pay for it? What you've already accepted is this scarcity framework and you lose. So convincing progressive movements that this is a really important fight to not accept to not accept their premises is hard because a lot of people have invented good language that has worked for them in the short term that's helped them. So, for example, when someone says, how are you going to pay for it? You say, we're going to tax those damn rich fat cats. That works because that identifies a villain and that makes it seem like you're going to get a pot of stuff that's currently being squandered. Unfortunately, it also means that if you fail against that villain, you fail to get your funding. So it, it means that you have to win both or neither. And to, to be honest, we haven't done a very good job of beating the rich. And the point here is the first thing that's going to help us beating the rich is if the rest of us aren't starving and living in poverty, which is taking up so much of our time and energy. So rather than saying, let's not get any butter until we stop spending on guns, Let's stop fighting that as a dichotomy where we accept the idea that you have to trade off between them. Let's have guns and butter until the point we're all fat enough to fight the people with guns, right? right. So right. what you're doing is very important. The people who are advising social movements, working on other issues to change their language and get more consistent is, is doing good work. People in the MMT, can you still hear me? Have I lost you? I'm not sure if you can still hear me. I'm sorry. Um, I've got a frozen screen. Um, apologies if you. Oh, you can hear me. Okay, I'll keep. I'll keep speaking. I'm getting those those text messages, even though Stephen's screen's frozen. Screen is frozen. Okay, so. The once you get past that sort of 